I like the reference in that song to when we are plagued by unbelief, the way that Christ lifts us up. It reminds me of the man who cries out to Jesus and he says, I believe, but help my unbelief. And we have all, I think, been at that place as we think about the trials of life and as we think about the way God works in us and uh, what a blessing it is to know that he preserves us. He preserves us in faith. He preserves us trusting in him, trusting in his gospel, believing that Christ has come for us and he will come back for us again. And one of the means that God uses to preserve us, to preserve our belief, to keep us believing is the gathering with his people on the Lord's Day. The gathering with his people here on Sunday to worship him. And so praise God that he has uh, in his grace, that's the only reason we're here, in his grace and his providence, he's brought us here this morning to praise him, to hear from his word, to be with his people. And how that does lift up our souls and bring us uh, into deeper, greater trust in him. So we thank him for this opportunity. If you would go with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Today we are in verse 14. And we are returning to the Ten Commandments as we are working our way through the book of Exodus. So you'll see the posters on the wall there if you're visiting with us today or if you just haven't noticed those before uh, by, by some chance. Uh, they are letting us all remember where we are rooted in the scriptures. And we take that seriously here at Four Corners. We've done this for a long time. We really believe uh, in what we say in our vision, that we are building on exposition, that everything uh, in the life of this church is built on God's word. We, we have that desire. We want that to be the case. And so we want to surround ourselves with uh, where it is in God's word we are. We're in Exodus. And, of course, the Ten Commandments are, are first given. They're also given in Deuteronomy 5, but they're first given in Exodus 20. And so in our trek through Exodus, we are in the Ten Commandments here in Exodus 20. And so far we've looked at the first six commandments. And uh, I'll give those to you in the words of the sermon title. So Yahweh alone, no idolatry, honoring God's name, the Sabbath day, honoring parents, and no Murder. So that's what we've seen so far. And last week, we looked at this last one, murder, the sixth commandment. And we considered this commandment in terms of three things, or we looked at it from three different angles. From the angle of violence, of attacking another person. Uh, and of course, this would be the actual act of murder as we understand it, but also wrapped into that uh, all sorts of physical harm. Ways that we harm other people. Ways that uh, we can detract from and even take their lives. And then we looked at it from the angle of anger. That, uh, as we read just before, um, and I had Trevor read that, that part on anger just to kind of bridge between last week and this week. But we, we see that anger itself, hatred in our hearts, anger towards those uh, in, in our world is also a form of murder. And uh, we understand this practically to also be a seed of actual physical murder. Uh, as we think about, uh, we talked about Cain and, and Joseph's brothers. That murder begins with this rage, this anger, this hatred in the heart. And then that spills over into the actual taking of another person's life. We've taken that person's life in our own minds before we take their life in practice. And so uh, we look at this command, this commandment in terms of anger. And then finally, in terms of negligence, that packed into the sixth commandment, uh, there is also the command to preserve life and to prioritize the safety of human beings and to not do things that neglect the safety and well-being of other people. So violence, anger, and negligence and as we've been going through the commandments, I think there are so many things that we can see. But just briefly, I want to remind us of three 
uh, things that we're constantly seeing, three patterns. And that is first off, love of neighbor. That Especially as we hit these last six, we are seeing what love of neighbor looks like. And as Christian ethicists have have said and written about for years, uh, what we find in these latter six commandments are are basically a summary of all of our dealings with other people. And so we see here that what is really in view ultimately is love of neighbor, that when we, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, love someone as ourselves, when we treat another person as we would desire to be treated, we are fulfilling these commandments. So of course, you're not going to murder someone when you are treating them as you would want to be treated, as you are loving them as Yourself, So love of neighbor encapsulate the, encapsulates these commands. Also, we're seeing this movement between the act itself and the heart. And by act, I mean the external act with our members that have the external effects associated with that act as we think about murder. We're seeing this movement between the act itself on the outside with its outside effects and the internal workings of the heart and of the mind. And it just reminds us that God sees all of it. He doesn't just see Cain striking Abel. He sees all the nastiness and ugliness in his heart. God sees us all the time. There's never a moment when God does not peer into the recesses of our hearts. He knows us better than we ever could know ourselves. He knows us better than our our spouse knows us. He sees all. And he takes what happens on the inside as seriously as what happens on the outside. And this is the fundamental problem with hypocrisy. That there's something different going on on the inside than is what is being put out there for people to perceive on the outside. The Lord cares about all of it. It matters what we do and what we think. And then a third observation, so love of neighbor and from act to heart, is these commandments also move from the narrow to the broad. And we've talked about that before, but I just want to reiterate that today, that it, it, we have a specific command. But what we find is, in terms of Christian ethics, Christian morality, that these things begin to ripple out into all areas of life. And so as you think about murder, we see... Uh, substance abuse, uh, and the way that uh, we think about food and other sorts of things as we think about how we care for our own bodies and how we care for other people. Stopping at stop signs and wearing our seatbelt and all of those sorts of things fall under a command like you shall not murder. So they, they go from being very specific to being very broad. So that what we would understand is that the Ten Commandments encompass all of Christian morality, all of what we would understand to be God's revealed will for human life. So today we come to number seven. We've covered six. Today we come to number seven. And the title for the sermon this morning is The Seventh Commandment, No Adultery. So if you would stand with me as we read God's word together, No Adultery. (coughs) By the way, let me just say this. We have represented with, with any of these, with any sermon, but with any of these commandments, we have represented here all sorts of situations in people's lives. Uh, there may be people in this room this morning who are contemplating adultery, but that's not far fetched. People in this room right now who are engaged in adultery. There may be people in this room right now who uh, have lived with adultery in the past. They've, they've either uh, been the recipient of that sin or they have been the perpetrator of that sin. And so here's the thing we need to understand. The Lord is sovereign and gracious to take what we find here and to apply that in ways that bring comfort, that bring grace, and that also stop the sinner in his or her tracks. And so we just praise God that the Holy Spirit is working. He's doing all of that among us this morning. 
as we come to his word on such a topic that's so sensitive and and so painful, uh, but also so very convicting. So let's read. We're going to read all of uh, the Ten Commandments, as we've been doing. We should all have these memorized by the time we get to Commandment 10. We've at least, we will at least have read them ten times. Um, so uh, chapter 20 of Exodus, we'll read verses 1 to 17, and our focus today will be on verse 14. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> and God spoke all these words, saying, I am, by the way, that's where God starts, I am. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or idol or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers, on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. By the way, I go back and forth between Lord, capital L-O-R-D, and Yahweh. Uh, the Hebrew is Yahweh, but it's been translated here as Lord. So uh, just understand that I just sort of go between those two. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. You can go ahead and be seated. Let's pray and ask for God's help as we come to his word that he would help me, as I preach, that he would help all of us as we listen, and that he would do that work that I mentioned before in our hearts, that he would do the work that only he can do as the sovereign Lord, who knows where each of us is this morning, who knows all of our hearts, he knows what's lurking, and he knows what is inflamed and in need of his healing, and so we pray that he will do that. Father, we thank you that you are present with us And that you have given us your word, our medicine for all of our ailments, our wisdom for all of our folly. And Lord, the conviction that we need as we chase after this fallen world. Lord, as we think about the flesh, the the mortal body, as we think about uh, the sin that indwells us still. God, we need your word. We need the convicting power of your spirit using your word to root out all forms of adultery that are present in us this morning to comfort those who have been uh, sinned against in this way and to uh, bring the healing and the grace that is needed for those in the past who have committed it. And Lord, the greater uh, commitment To never do it again. Father, we're grateful that you are so sovereign and so good and so wise. And we pray that your spirit would work among us this morning in very incisive ways uh, that only he can do. And we pray, God, that you would be glorified, that we would be edified and brought nearer to you and nearer to one another. And Lord, we pray that marriages would be brought closer together today. And Lord, we pray for your protection uh, by your spirit from the enemy. Lord, may it not be 
uh, that through this sermon and through this topic where there has been adultery in the past and you have healed and you have brought uh, forgiveness and grace, may it not be that Satan uses this time today to stir up strife. But God, may it be that your grace just becomes more highlighted and your goodness And may there just be greater commitment to press into marital fidelity and God-honoring love for one another. Lord, we praise you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. (coughs) As we look at God's command not to commit adultery, I want to break it into two major parts. I wrestled with how to organize this this morning, but I think... Uh, this, this is at least one way to come at it. So I want to break it into two major parts. So here they are. First, the significance of marriage. And secondly, we'll take on the sin of adultery as a whole. We'll have some various parts there that we'll, we'll look at. So the significance of marriage and to the sin of adultery. And our text here is very short. You shall not commit adultery. So last week, when we were discussing murder, we saw that you can't really understand the gravity of this sin without first understanding the importance of human life. You know, a lot of people um, understand that murder, in fact, you would, we would think most, if not all people, intuitively understand the gravity of murder. But then you begin to ask questions and you realize they, they don't really have a moral foundation. This is the problem with the ev- evolutionary worldview. There really is no moral foundation. There's no foundation for if human beings simply evolve from uh, some ancient organism and we're just one branch of the many branched tree then there really is no difference at the end of the day between uh, two chimpanzees or two lizards uh, or two humans uh, in exacting violence against one another. So we understand that the gravity of this sin begins with understanding the importance of human life. Our world recognizes it is wrong to kill, to murder, but often has no moral foundation for that. God's design and the place of human beings in it, the value that God places on human beings as his image bearers, that is the foundation for understanding why murder is so atrocious. And it is the understanding for something like capital punishment. Uh, we believe in capital punishment and the death penalty because of the gravity of killing a human being made in God's image. That's what's going on in Genesis 9. That's what's going on in Romans 13. It is because of our conviction that human beings are made in God's image that we take murder so, so, so seriously. Well, the same is true when it comes to adultery. Unless we get the significance of marriage in place... Adultery may not really seem all that bad. And I think this is especially the case in our culture. There are several ingredients that when you put them into a bowl and mix them up, you get a low view of adultery. It's not really that big of a deal. And many people would, in our culture would hate to have adultery committed against them, but really don't think, if you ask them, That it is all that big of a deal. And I think there are several ingredients, as I said before, that that create this mindset. First, there's just simply worship of self. Uh, It is basically about pleasing self. If your spouse stops fulfilling your needs, then you go and get those needs met somewhere else. If you are not satisfied, then uh, you need to follow your heart. And find that fulfillment and that satisfaction, that self-care that will ultimately result in the pleasure that you receive for yourself. So worship of self is very much a part of our culture. And and all that goes with that, self-expression, 
very much a part of the LGBTQ revolution as we think about transgenderism in particular. All of it is about just simply asserting and expressing the desires and inclinations of self. Worship of self. Also, an empty view of love. Love with no basis in biblical morality, no basis in God's love, no basis in the notion of covenant. Love simply being those fluttery feelings. Love simply being that sense of, of, of well-being in relation to another person. They make me happy. Isn't it amazing? Even I've thought about this even in talking with my own wife, how often we will talk to our, our spouse about how much we love them, and then what will we do? We will begin to rehearse all the ways that they fulfill us. Right? I love you. You make me. You help me. You're, it, it, it just, it's a boomerang, right? It's a boomerang. The value is found in how this person fills me up not intrinsically in them and in the covenant that binds us together with them. So when that person stops fulfilling, stops satisfying, stops filling up the tank, well, you just fall out of love. You just don't feel it. Just don't feel it. Just an empty view of love with no basis and, of course, rampant sexual immorality, the great freedom with which uh, people find sexual pleasure and express themselves sexually, rampant sexual immorality. And then finally, little concern for commitment, for fidelity, for faithfulness. So when, when you stir up worship of self and an empty view of love and rampant sexual immorality and little concern for commitment, out pops a low view of Divorce, a low view of adultery and, and divorce, low view of marriage, divorce, adultery, and all the rest. So the first thing I want to do is spend a little time talking about the significance of marriage. And obviously there's so much that could be said here, but I want to just lay some basic foundation. We all recognize that marriage is basic to human society. That's part of just the image of God in us. We, we all know that. Even if we rebel against that, if we make laws against that, we structure society against that, uh, we promote policies in order to get elected against that, whatever the case might be, we all know this to be true. Just like we know murder is wrong. We all recognize that this is basic to human society. It is the foundation for families, and therefore it is the foundation for civilization. A civilization is a conglomerate of families. It's a bringing together of many, many families. Children come into the world through marriage. Future citizens are cared for and trained within the context of marriage. Uh, the, the marriages today are giving rise to the populations of tomorrow. This is the, the breeding ground, literally, as well as the, uh, the, the way in which people are trained for life. And we talked about this with honoring father and mother, that the way in which a person learns to be a good citizen, to be respectful to the police officer who pulls him or her over, to be respectful to the judge in court, to be respectful when, uh, and, and obedient and submissive when paying taxes, and so on and so forth, is by honoring mom and dad. That's where it starts. All that we do as citizens begins in the living room, in the bedroom. It begins in the front yard and the backyard, in the minivan. It begins in the family. Even in ancient pagan societies, it was recognized that marriage was not something to be taken lightly. And so we see this, for example, in Genesis chapter 20, verse 9, with Abimelech, Abimelech of Gerar. Abimelech is a Philistine, and we know the story, or you may know the story, we, we talked about this when we went through Genesis, that Abraham goes into Gerar, and he, the second time, he lies about his wife. It's a half lie because she's his half sister. But Sarah, his wife, he says, she's my sister. And the result is that Abimelech 
takes her for his wife or, or takes her into his palace. And, of course, the Lord protects Sarah. Uh, there's no adultery committed. Abimelech does not uh, touch her. But it says here, as, as Abimelech finds out, because the Lord afflicts their household, afflicts the kingdom, and as it is discovered, this is what Abimelech says to Abraham. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? What is the great sin that Abraham has brought upon the kingdom? Well, it is Abimelech taking another man's wife as his own into his own home. You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And so you see here, Abimelech recognizes he calls uh, adultery, or at least the lead up to adultery, a great sin. And in fact, interestingly... Ancient Egyptian and Canaanite sources show that adultery was actually referred to as a great sin. So even in these pagan civilizations, these pagan societies, where there is no regard for the Lord, where a Romans 1 kind of situation has happened, they've lost sight of the Creator, they've exchanged, uh, put the creature in place of the Creator, even in those situations, there's the recognition that this thing is no good, that adultery is a great sin, a great wrong. And this recognition goes all the way back to the beginning of human history. You know, though we are spread out into nations, we're all related, distant cousins, distant relatives. How so? Because we all go back to one man and woman, Adam and Eve. So this recognition... Not only is it built into the heart of man as we think about human beings made in the image of God, but it also goes back to the the beginning of human civilization as we go all the way back to Adam and Eve. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 20 to 25. I'm going to read these verses because they're so important for us understanding the significance of marriage, what marriage is, and where it comes from. Genesis 2, verses 20 to 25. The man gave names to all livestock. So it's just Adam in the garden with the Lord and the animals. He gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, (coughs) there was not found a helper fit for him. So (coughs) So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Beautiful scene. Can't imagine it. It's just so beautiful. Now here's the Lord walking Eve down the aisle to Adam. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He is blown away. She shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They're, they're, they come from one flesh, they re enter into one flesh through sexual union, and they are one flesh. And then it goes on to say, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is a covenant. Union. Jesus describes it as what God has joined together, what God has bound together as he teaches on divorce. What God has joined together, let no man separate, or in the King James Version, let no one tear asunder, tearing it apart. This is a covenant union, one man with one woman for life, joined together as one flesh, leaving and cleaving. So we recognize That even in our honoring of mom and dad, we must leave and cleave to our spouse. So this new relationship between husband and wife becomes more significant, more central than the relationship with mom and dad. Though we never cease to honor mom and dad, we may have to relate with our mother and father in ways that are different because of this primary relationship, this one 
flesh. We leave and cling to our spouse. And even in the naked and not ashamed, we see the intention of mutual trust, of security, and fidelity. So, of course, the naked and unashamed most fundamentally has to do with the relationship with God, that they are free from shame and guilt as they move about the garden with no clothes. It's a picture of their their innocence. It's a picture of their freedom in the Lord's presence. But after they sin, they hide themselves, they make clothing for themselves, and then God puts clothing from a sacrificed animal to cover them, from the skins of an animal, to cover them, to cover their nakedness and shame, to cover their guilt as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ covering our sins. But what we see here is that there's also a horizontal dynamic. They are naked and unashamed, not just before God, but before one another. And then sin enters the world, and that shame, and that guilt, and that insecurity, and that rupture happens not just on a vertical level, but also horizontally between husband and wife. And you begin to see they're throwing each other under the bus, at least Adam. He says, the woman whom you gave me, God, you you gave her to me. Remember, she's the one who did all of this. She Messed everything up. This is the first marital fight. Probably right after that conversation. It was the first marital fight in the Bible. This passage in Genesis 2 becomes the bedrock text for New Testament teaching on marriage. And so as we move from that to the New Testament, we see it with Jesus, for example, in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6, as he teaches against divorce. So listen to Jesus' words here regarding the significance of marriage. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning (coughs) made them male and female and said, therefore, so he's quoting Genesis 2.24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is Jesus' doctrine of marriage. This is Jesus' theology of marriage. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And then we also see Paul quoting from this Genesis passage as he gives his theology of marriage in Ephesians 5. And that leads us to this final point from Ephesians 5. And as I said before, there's a lot that you can say about marriage. But I want to end on this very significant point from Ephesians 5. Marriage, we are told, is a picture of something far greater than itself. Marriage is a picture of something beyond itself. As Paul interacts with Genesis 2 and lays out his theology of marriage in Ephesians 5. Just as the significance of human life is found in the image of God, so too is the significance of marriage found in the gospel of God. So let me say it this way, and I'll explain it in a moment. To murder a human being is to assault the image of God. To commit adultery is to assault the gospel of God in a very specific way. Listen to how Paul describes the husband-wife relationship after quoting Genesis 2.24. This is what he says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. This mystery is profound. So he's just quoted Genesis 2, and now he's going to explain it. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This is amazing. In other words, what Paul is saying is that Christ is present. Now, we know Christ is present throughout the Old Testament. But what Paul is saying is that Christ is present in uh, the comments that we just read from the Lord describing the relationship between Adam and his new wife, Eve. That they are bound together as one flesh. Paul interprets that and says this is all about Jesus Christ. It refers to Christ and the church. In other words, the one flesh relationship between husband and wife, your marriages, my marriage, in which a wife submits to her husband and a husband gives himself up for his wife 
and nourishes and cherishes her as his very own body. This relationship is a picture of Christ and the church. This is the one great illustration of the gospel. Now we know we have the ordinances, the sacraments, as we think about baptism and the Lord's Supper, pictures of the gospel. But what we're being told by Paul is that every marriage, though broken, though imperfect, and especially more and more realized in a Christian marriage, that this marriage, these marriages, our marriages, are little, gleaming, shining, diamond pictures of the gospel, of Christ's relationship with his church. As Christ gave himself up for his bride, the church, so too are husbands to die to themselves for their wives. And as the church submits to Christ, so too are wives to submit to their own husbands. So marriage is not just about creation. We're not just talking about God's design in creation, which we just discussed from Genesis 2, though that is true. This is the way God made us. This is the way God made the world. Marriage is part of God's creational design. It is a good thing. It is a wonderful thing. It is a beautiful thing. But it's even more than that. Marriage is also about redemption. It is a picture of God's goodness in creating us to fill the earth and subdue it and Even more, it is a picture of his goodness in sending his own son to save us. Every time you witness a married couple where the husband lays down his life for his wife, dies to himself to care for his wife, and the wife respects and submits to her husband and honors him and holds him up, you are seeing a beautiful picture of the gospel of Christ and his church. This is Evangelism 101, by the way. And let me say this. This is Evangelism 101 in the home. Uh, Allowing rot to take over your marriage is more than just uh, stripping away your own happiness. It is infecting your children and their view of the gospel, their view of Christ and his church. It is eroding away this God-ordained portrait of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. How much better would it be? How wonderful would it be if by God's grace our marriages held up, though imperfectly, this picture so that our children see the Christ portion and the church portion woven together as a beautiful picture of the gospel. That should be our desire for our marriages. It's more than about our own happiness. It's more than about growing old together. It's more than about just having fun together. It's more than about date night and just getting through raising children or getting through paying bills or getting through all the, it's it's more than that. It's not just a partnership. It's a gospel reality. It has gravity and weight beyond what we can even imagine. It is not to be an idol. It is to be a picture of the true God whom we are to worship. The God who has sent his son. So there is a reason why we refer to marriage as holy. We call it holy matrimony. And maybe you've wondered, you know, well, that's just, that's, that's just church language. That's just marriage language. It just sounds really good when you got the dress on and the tuxedo on and, and you know, everything, everybody's dressed up and it's great. It just sounds like this is holy. Well, there's a reason that it's holy. And it fundamentally goes back to this. Let me just say before we move on that this is a battlefield of the mind. This really is a battlefield of worldview. Satan will try to cheapen our view of marriage. And let me say this to all of us. This is the first step toward adultery. Let me ask you this question. What if Satan has a target date for your adultery 20 years from now? He's patient in all the evil ways, in all the diabolical ways. What if he has a target date for 2043? For your adultery. And he's just working right now toward that aim. He's in no rush. 
He's got plenty of time. The first step toward that tumbling, toward that catastrophe, toward that fall, is to cheapen your view of marriage. It is to strip away all of its holiness. It is to strip away all of its gospel realities. It is to make it as nothing. It is to fill your mind with all the world's wisdom and all the world's pleasures and all the world's view of reality so that 20 years from now, you fall. Might not be today, and it might not be next week, but what will happen down the road? It begins now, bathing our minds in the reality of the gospel helps us to build up the picture of that reality. Let me say that again. As we bathe our minds in the reality of the gospel, as we live gospel-centered lives, as we are constantly praying the Lord's Prayer, our Father, through Christ our Lord, who died for our sake, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name magnified in Christ on the cross and risen in me by the Spirit. As we simply flow in all of life out of the gospel, as we are constantly rejoicing in the gospel and giving thanks to God in Christ Jesus, as we're doing this, we are guarding our marriages from adultery because we're guarding our knowledge and love for the reality to which the picture points. There is a lot more we could say about marriage, but I want to at least get these basic building blocks in place as we think about the significance of marriage. So secondly, now we move to the sin of adultery. To commit adultery is to sin against everything I just said. It's to assault everything that we just talked about. It is to sin against this marital union as we sin against God. It is to break this one flesh covenant. It is to tear apart this beautiful picture of the gospel. It is to disregard and trample on this good gift of the creator. Thank you, God. Now throw it on the ground and stomp on it. It is to disregard it. It is to break trust in the most intimate relationship that we could possibly have on this planet. This is, the, this, is, this is as good as it is meant to get. This is as intimate as it is meant to get. Our relationship with our spouses is number one aside from the Lord. And in fact, we relate to the Lord in how we relate to our spouse. Marriage is the first and most foundational relationship. And that is why God often characterizes idolatry as adultery. The Lord doesn't have to look far and wide for a picture of idolatry. He simply goes to marital unfaithfulness. God gives the picture of himself married to Israel. And then in the New Covenant, we see Christ and his bride, the church. And God goes to adultery to depict what happens in idolatry. His bride has left him. His bride has gone out for another. This is what happens in the Old Testament when they go after Ashtoreth or Baal or Molech or whatever else. All of these gods, so-called of the ancient world, when they chase after these gods, it is as though God, as the, as the husband, has, has lost his wife to another as she has gone out and committed adultery. So given its gravity, God puts this commandment as the head of all sexual morality. Notice it. It stands in the place of all sexual sin. There, there's no other commandment, apart from the 10th commandment, which is wrapped into this one about coveting, there's no other commandment about sexual sin per se, like this one. So we're meant to, understood, to understand in terms of ethics that it stands in the place of all sexual sin. Back to the narrow and the broad. The narrow is adultery, but when we begin to broaden that out, we realize that all deviant sexual practices, all sexual immorality is encompassed under this one command. But God has chosen this one to stand at the head. 
it narrowly focuses on adultery, but broadly gets applied. One man with one woman for life. That's where sex happens. That's where sexual activity happens. That's where sexual pleasure is found. Let me say it again. One man, one woman for life. Bound together, not just for physical pleasure, but in every aspect of life. Emotionally, physically, spiritually, bound together so that the physical act itself is always infused with the other stuff. It's never just a using of another person as a tool for one's own pleasure, but rather the blending together of this intimacy of soul and body in love. There there is no romantic drama, no silly story, no great love epic that in any way compares to this. All love stories, Romeo and Juliet and all the rest, pale in comparison and are as nothing compared to the vision for marital bliss and love that the Bible puts out. And though we recognize that we're broken, marriages are broken, we are broken, sin is present, but that doesn't detract from the great model that the Lord holds up for all of us. That doesn't detract from the great and glorious vision that God has for us to, listen, enjoy sexual pleasure in marriage. God made us. He made our bodies. He made our nerves. He made everything in us. And sexual pleasure in marriage glorifies God. It glorifies him. As we talk about the sin of adultery itself, I want to break it into three categories. So this is where we'll finish up this morning, three categories. The physical act, divorce and remarriage, and the lustful eyes. We'll just be moving through each of these, not a lot of time. I, we, we talked about the lustful eyes when we are going through the Sermon on the Mount. We had a whole sermon on that passage in, in Matthew And we've talked about uh, these in other contexts as well. But we're going to move through each of these. The physical act, divorce and remarriage, and the lustful eye. So first, the physical act. We get further elaborations on the commandment in other portions of the Pentateuch. So let me just read these to you quickly. Leviticus 20.10, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor... Both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So in the Old Covenant, in the Mosaic Law, uh, adultery was punishable by death. Deuteronomy 22, 22. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman. Excuse me. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. It's an evil It's a cancerous evil that infects all of Israel. And let me just say this to us as a church. It will not just infect your marriage. It will infect this whole church. Engaging in any form of adultery, pornography, all the rest... It will infect the church. It will will affect your children. It will affect the church. It will infect your small group, your Christian friends. It, It is like a cancerous growth. It is a little leaven. Satan will convince you it's just little. It's leaven that leavens the whole lump. It's like a blazing fire. Proverbs has a lot to say about this, and I wish I could just, just stand up here and just read all these texts about from Proverbs. They're just so good about the absolute stupidity of adultery and the wickedness of it. Proverbs weave together the two opposites, delighting in one's wife, 
versus seeking sexual pleasure outside of the marriage. So Proverbs takes and holds these two things up as a great contrast, uh, delighting in one's wife and then seeking pleasure outside of that. So Proverbs 5, verses 15 to 21, drink water from your own cistern. Flowing water from your own well. Don't be digging around in someone else's well. Drink your own water. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice. Here it is. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. As I said, this is the most romantic stuff in the world. It doesn't get any better than that. We go look into the world for all kinds of garbage. And the Bible fills us with, with such beauty and wonder. Why should you be intoxicated, my son? This is uh, the author, this is Solomon speaking to his son. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his paths. He speaks of the, the woman, her, her lips are dripping with honey. But her path leads to hell. It, it looks so good. It looks so appetizing, so pleasurable, so satisfying. Oh, it will be so good. No, it ends in hell. It ends in destruction. In this life, it creates a fire. To rejoice in the wife of your youth and to refrain from adultery is to hold the marriage bed in honor. As it says in Hebrews 13, verse 4, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Do you see the seriousness of the teaching on this matter? It is no small thing to just keep struggling with pornography. It is no small thing to just keep giving ourselves to these sins, to letting our minds just fantasize about someone else. These things are no small sins. God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. I think Proverbs chapter 6, verses 32 to 33, is one of those powerful punches. And as I said before, there are perhaps some in this room right now engaged in adultery. Or considering it. Listen to these words from Proverbs chapter 6, verses 32 to 33. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. It is as though you walk outside and cover yourself in gasoline and light a match. You just burn yourself up. He destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor and his disgrace will not be wiped away. This is what God's word in the wisdom literature in Proverbs says is the outcome of adultery. That it blazes through the life, consuming the life. To commit adultery is to utterly hate yourself. It is to bring ruin on yourself in a particular way, we are told. That's not what Satan tells you. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what Satan told Eve. God told Eve, God told Adam, who presumably told Eve himself, that this is going to ruin you if you do it. And Satan said, oh, no, 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 no. This will fill you up. This will exalt you. This will make you so happy. And we all want happiness. This will make you happy. It will make you feel real nice. It is a lie. And God's word tells us the truth. So first, we have the physical act itself. Second, divorce and remarriage. Now, this is a big topic, but here I just want to point out on a basic level that to divorce and remarry without biblical warrant is to commit adultery. And this flies in the face of so much in our culture. 
where divorce is just so rampant, divorce and remarriage, it's just part of the air that we breathe. This is common practice. But what we find in Scripture is that to divorce and remarry without biblical warrant is to commit adultery. Jesus makes this clear in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19. So chapter 5, verse 32. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And then chapter 19, verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Paul, we later read under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, adds to this another exception in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15. So Jesus says, unless there is a case, except in the case of sexual immorality, of porneia, except in the case of sexual immorality, then it is adultery to divorce and to remarry. Paul also gives an exception in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, in which an unbelieving spouse deserts or abandons the believer. So he says this in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 15, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. So I understand the exception clause, Matthew 5, to be for both divorce and for remarriage. And also understand when Paul says that you're not enslaved, uh, that that would imply the ability to get remarried. So, But apart from these two, we are told that it is Adultery. Now, there is much discussion among Christians as to how to apply these texts to specific situations. And we've had to wrestle through this as elders. And in fact, even recently, we've decided as elders to pull together uh, some, t- some time to do reading on this question, particularly in the area of church discipline and how we counsel uh, married couples, but to look at this, is- this larger issue of marriage divorce, remarriage, and to to study that and discuss that as elders. So there's much discussion among Christians as to how to apply these texts, but what I want you to see here is that this idea of divorce and remarriage runs very much contrary to the way it is seen in our culture, and it is relevant to the seventh commandment. One of the ways that we can break the seventh commandment is to divorce and remarry without biblical warrant. That is, to commit adultery. Now, let, let me say this. As one commentator put it, divorce, is not the un, divorce and remarriage is not the unpardonable sin, right? So, uh, as with other sins, this is a, a situation where God offers his forgiveness through Jesus Christ, through Christ's work on the cross. Uh, that, that as we reflect back on our past and as we reflect back on what, what has happened in our lives, that we go to God for grace and he forgives. And, and we see from those texts that the, the remarriage is itself a marriage. It's, it's not uh, X'd out. It's not canceled. It is a marriage. So, this is not beyond God's forgiveness But let me say this to all of us in our divorce-saturated culture. It is a sin that needs to be confessed and repented of and dealt with. It is not something to merely be pushed under the rug. It is something to talk with the Lord about. It is something to seek his face on. And it is something to never do as we lean into the future. So divorce and remarriage. Thirdly, we see the lustful eyes. The lustful eyes. And this is where we're going to finish this morning. Matthew 5, verses 27 to 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Now listen to this. Listen to how Jesus brings this down. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'm just going to pause there. In person, on a screen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Looks at a woman with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. 
And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. I want to make three quick observations here before we finish. First is, I want you to see the heart. This form of adultery happens in the heart and it is motivated by sinful sexual desire. To look at a woman with the intent in order to lust for her, in order to take her in sexually. And, and let me just say, don't, let's not cheat ourselves in thinking that this only means to, to look at her or him, to, to look at that person in a way that you're already beginning to fantasize about that person in your mind. You're, you're, you're sort of playing out images and situations in your mind. No, that, that's, that's cheapening this. It, it deals with the motive. It deals with the bent. As the eyes move, what's the bent of the heart? And how long do those eyes stay? And that moves us to the eyes. So we have the heart. It is motivated by sinful sexual desire. And then we have the eyes. <clears throat> and I think here we have kind of a chicken and an egg situation. Is it the eyes first or is it the heart first? Yes and yes. Eyes both feed and carry out desire. The heart moves the eyes forward. And the eyes incite the heart. We fuel this sin of the heart the more we look, the more we take in, the more that our eyes are not on what we are doing and on the wife of our youth, the husband of our youth. As our eyes roam about, taking in the beauty. Beauty, of course, is recognized. We know that. It is seen and recognized and instantaneously processed. Move on. Move on. And then finally, by the way, let me just say this here. It is so common to treat pornography as something other than adultery. We need to understand here this morning that what we are reading here gives the picture that pornography is not something that all men just struggle with. It's not something that we just sort of, you know, we just... Just bring some brothers alongside of you and keep confessing it, and then you can just keep doing it. No. Confess it all you want. Stop doing it. Don't just think because you confess it to a brother, you have three guys around you, and you're telling them when you do it that that's a justification for continuing to do it. It is adultery to Christ. And he says, better to pluck out the eye or chop off the hand or get rid of the computer than to keep doing it. Stop. For Christ's sake, hear his warning. See his cross in gratitude, repent of this sin. And also, as he lays out for us here, in fear of hell, repent of this sin. Let me remind you of the words of 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. For those of us who cheapen salvation, for those of us who have an easy believism mindset about the gospel, for those of us who think, I, I prayed a prayer and I'm now saved, Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous don't end up in heaven. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That is sobering. Stop petting the sin. Stop playing with it as, as if it's no big deal. Stop, stop presuming on God's grace through Christ's work on the cross and kill sin for Christ's sake. That's what Jesus says here. Pluck out the eye. Cut off the hand. It's a hyperbole. He's not saying go home this afternoon and start dismembering yourself or start marring yourself. What he's saying is do whatever it takes do whatever it takes to put sin to death. 
you shall not commit adultery. And praise God that though we have all committed adultery, Jesus Christ suffered as an adulterer on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He never had an adulterous thought in his life, but he died for all of our adultery, which we've all committed. And so we praise him for his grace. And because of his grace, we step out into the future in holiness of life, putting sin to death wherever it may be found. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us by your spirit, that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would assure us of the gospel of grace through Christ, Lord, and at the same time that you would protect us from presuming on your grace in wickedness. Lord, we pray that we would celebrate what Christ has accomplished for us by stepping out into a life of obedience to you and love for you and love for your commands. God, that we would be like the psalmist in Psalm 119 or in Psalm 1, that we would delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it day and night. And through that, that we would be like this God-glorifying tree with leaves filled with gospel pictures of marriage. Protect us, Lord, we pray. For apart from that, we will all fall. Protect us, help us, keep us. We pray through Jesus Christ. Amen.